Welcome to the seventh class about deep reinforcement learning. As I just said, in fact, we are now switching from standard discrete state and discrete action reinforcement learning to the deep reinforcement learning case where the state and action can be continuous. In this particular class, I will introduce the famous DQN algorithm, which uses a continuous state and a discrete action domain and we will make profit of some of the concepts presented in the previous classes. So first we have to deal with that particular issue. So far we have dealt with these kinds of problems where you have a discrete set of states and a discrete set of actions so you can record one value for each, for each state and for each action or for each state action pair. If we switch to a continuous domain, either for state or for action, we are rather like this. The point is that we cannot represent a function over a continuous domain by storing a value for each possible uh, variable in the value of the variables in the domain. Okay, we cannot enumerate all values for all the states and all the actions because there are an infinity of such uh, states or actions. So what can we do? In fact, what we can do is use a parameterized representation. First, let's introduce linear representations. What we can do, for instance, is use, is use a set of features like Gaussian functions that are represented here in three dimensions. So here we have nine Gaussian functions and with, uh, to all of these Gaussian functions, we associate one single weight. So I have one weight for that Gaussian, one weight for that Gaussian, etc. So I have nine weights. And with just these nine weights, I can represent any function that appears as a linear combination of those Gaussians um, multiplied by, by the weights. Okay? And the point of learning a representation for the critique uh, if we are using a critic-based algorithm or for a policy, if we are using a policy-based algorithm, will consist in tuning the weights of such representation. So remember that a linear architecture is the case where you have a linear combination of features. The case of feedforward neural network is a little more complicated. In fact, we also have linear combination of features, but the features themselves can change over time through learning. For instance, if you take this very simple two three layers neural network, in fact, at the higher level, at the output of the network, you have a linear combination of weights multiplied by the final function, okay, which can be a, a simple linear function. Okay. But the point is that what goes as input to these functions are themselves features that are here. And those features also have parameters. And if you change the parameters that are here, the weights and the biases of the previous net neurons in the previous layer, you change the feature function themselves. For instance, if I use a sigmoid function with a weight of one, I have this sigmoid. But if I multiply it by a weight of minus one, then I and, and I use a bias, I get this function. And if I change the weight uh, uh, such as 0 0.5, then I change this function that way. So by tuning the weights through back propagation from here to here, not only I change the linear combination, but also I change the features. And the point with deep neural network is that they will find the adequate feature to represent what I need to represent in order to learn my particular function. Okay. Another point is that using sigmoids instead of Gaussian functions, as in the previous example, uh, results in a better capabilities to split a high dimensional uh, state space, for instance. Whereas with Gaussians, you have some local features and you need many, many Gaussians to pave a large uh, domain. Uh, okay, that's it for that particular slide. So a general motivation for deep reinforcement learning. So deep reinforcement learning will consist in using deep neural network with potentially s several layers together with reinforcement learning. And the motivation for doing this is, is the following. In fact, approximation with deep network, if you use enough computational power, can be very accurate. And accuracy matters a lot in reinforcement learning, as, as we will see later on. Okay. Uh, besides um, those deep network 
learning mechanisms are provided in library like Teano, Cafe, TensorFlow, PyTorch. TensorFlow and PyTorch being the two modern ones that everybody is using now. So you don't have to um, code again for, for backpropagation. And all the processes that we will use in deep reinforcement learning will be based on efficient backpropagation in those deep networks. Um, so let's switch to DQN. So what's DQN? The ID con just consists in using Q-learning based on a deep neural network. I must say before going into DQN itself that this has been done before. In particular, Tesoro in uh, 95 uh, managed to learn a neural network representation with reinforcement learning algorithm that was the first world, world champion um, in backgammon, so the, the first computer program who was able to defeat the world champion in a reasoning game, let's say. Uh, but another point is that at the same time where Tesoro obtained this very interesting result in practice, people like Lemon Baird have shown that reinforcement learning combined with function approximation, which is the case with deep neural network, can diverge. He just showed a very simple counter example where in fact using reinforcement learning based on function, function approximation diverges to something that has no meaning. Okay. So DQN is the same idea as Tesoro, but the very point is that in DQN they managed to learn very complicated thing that I will describe just later on um, without encountering this division problem. So the main question is how do they do so? And this is what I will explain to you in this particular class. So DQN become, became famous because uh, people at uh, Google DeepMind, those guys, uh, manage with the same algorithm, which is DQN, to learn to play um, simple computer games called Atari games because they correspond to good old Atari games that uh, we were playing when we were young like Pac-Man etc etc so they managed to learn to play 57 games at a level similar to human level performance and the key point is that this algorithm was only taking as input an image of the game actually four successive images of the, of the game uh, as input without any knowledge of what is the game about. So you can learn to play Pac-Man without knowing that there are ghosts running after you and that you should collect the pellets, etc, etc. And this result um, was quite astounding to the community because we thought that learning from images some reinforcement learning uh, with some reinforcement learning techniques was too complicated that the, the, the state space was huge and it was not possible to do so. So to obtain those results you must mention that DQN was running for weeks uh, with large uh, cluster of computers to, to manage to learn policies that converge, but what, what is very interesting is that they manage to learn those games with the same hyperparameters for all the games, which is quite uh, excellent in terms of uh, generalization capability. So how does it work? At the heart of DQN, you have what is called the, the Q network. So it is represented with this picture you take a state representation as input, so here it could be the, pixel of the pixels of an image and this could take continuous values, actually in pixels you get values between 0 and uh, 255, okay? And you have your network that computes through intermediate functions and at the, at the output you have one neuron per action and the neuron is supposed to, to give you the Q value of performing that particular action in that particular state. So if you think of it, this is exactly like a Q table where you have one value for each action in a particular state, but the point is that you have an infinity 
of states corresponding to a continuous domain. So this, this Q network is the equivalent of the Q table, but using a continuous state as input, but and then a discrete action as output. So to select the action, to, to perform your policy, you just need to find the max over the discrete actions that you get. So for instance, in Atari games, you have eight actions. So you just take the max of the eight Q values that you have as output, given a state as input. Of course, a limitation is that this requires to have one output neuron per action. So you cannot do this with continuous action domain. And we will see in a later class how DDPGs uh, goes around that particular limitation. Now the question is, how do you learn this Q network? So how do you learn the Q function? The idea is to get inspired from supervised learning. In supervised learning, in general, you want to minimize a loss function, which corresponds to a squared error with respect to some desired output. So if given your state and action, this is your desired output, and this is the output of your network, you want to minimize some distance between the desired and the actual value, which could be, for instance, the squared distance. Okay. And you will do so just by, by propagation of this error, this loss function, uh, on the weights theta of your uh, Q network. For doing so, in DQN, in fact, you will take a set of samples, which will be called a mini batch. You have uh, samples um, with an ind index E. And you should minimize, if you want the Q network to converge to something, in fact, you want the reward prediction error or the temporal difference error. This is the same thing as we saw before. So we want this expression to converge to zero. Okay. So if you want this expression to converge to zero, if, and if you look closely, these two expressions is simi are similar. If you take the desired value to be this one. So given a mini batch of n samples which contain this information, you can compute this value just using the information coming from here and using your Q network to determine this value. Okay. And then you want to minimize the loss function between this particular value uh, yi and the value output of your network over the mini batch of samples. Okay. So you are just trying to minimize the, the temporal difference error of your network given some samples using the propagation of the network. This is very simple in practice. Okay. One point, however, is that this is not stable. Why is this so? First, one point is that approximating a Q value is not exactly a supervised learning problem. The point is the following. In fact, in supervised learning, you want to go towards a desired value that is constant for a particular input. But here, your desired value is a function of, of Q, and this is Q that you are learning. So if you change Q through learning, you may change, you will probably change your desired value. And if they change in the same di direction, this may diverge because you want to increase this, this increase your desired value. To track it, you increase this, so it increases this, and so on and so on. So finally, it will diverge to infinity. This is why. Uh, combining reinforcement learning and function approximation may uh, diverge in practice. Okay, so this is not truly supervised learning, and this is unstable. So the trick that was used in DQN to super to stabilize this process consists in having periods of supervised learning. What you do is that you initialize this. Uh, okay, you take two network, a target network that I will call Q prime and a, the standard network that you are learning, which is Q. Okay. And you in initialize Q prime at the same value as, as Q. Then you learn on Q so as to go to that particular desired value without changing Q prime. And from time to time, for instance, each 5,000 time steps, you update Q prime so that it goes back to the value of Q. So you, per you perform new supervised learning each 5,000 time steps so that this network is tracking this one, but this one is moving more slowly. And this makes the process much more stable. The other trick consists in using replay buffer and shuffling it. Okay. Actually, this is an old idea, which dates back to the early 90s from Long Jilin. 
but this proved very efficient with uh, modern computational resources. So, so the, the point is the following. In most supervised learning and machine learning algorithm in general, when you want to approximate a function, you assume that the samples are independently and identically distributed. This means that the sample you get for training are representative of uh, what you will use at test time, and in particular, they are distributed more or less uniformly in the domain that you are sampling. Obviously, this is not the case of behavioral samples of a reinforcement learning agent, because the next sample strongly depends on the previous sample and the action you took. Okay, and in particular, an agent will explore a particular small domain before moving to somewhere else. So the samples won't be distributed uniformly over the domain. Okay. So a simple idea to break the correlation between the samples, which make it not independent and not identically distributed, consists in putting all the samples into a replay buffer and drawing the samples from the replay buffer more or less randomly. So what you can do is you fill your replay buffer and you take a few samples into a mini batch and you give this mini batch to your DQN network so that it learns the Q function. Okay. Um, in particular, you can use larger mini batch when you want to make profit of um, graphical processing units where the input of your network are images because this will be more efficient. You can do things in parallel. Okay. Actually, how to um, this determine the size of your replay buffer and how to put the samples in it is an issue. This is something that is under uh, investigations at the moment in several papers. And you can show that with different replay buffer size, for instance, you get very different performance for uh, your DQN algorithm. But basically, this is it. I have just explained to you DQN. So that's the idea of the Q network, which is more or less a Q table with function approximation in the state space. And then those two tricks, which are the stable, the target Q function, which stabilizes um, temporal difference error learning, and the replay buffer shuffling, which makes the samples more independent. And that's it. Now let's have a look at what happened after DQN. There, in fact, there, are, there has been a lot of improvements which make it that the performance is no higher than uh, what uh, DQN initially uh, obtained. The first improvement is called double DQN. This is from Hado van Asselt. And if you remember class 6, uh, in class 6 I explained to you that uh, a Q learning suffers from a gradient, so, sorry, from an overestimation bias due to, to propagation of overestimated value through the max operator. And actually, the SMAX operator is used both for action choice and value propagation. So in double Q learning, Hado van Asselt proposed to separate both calculations with two different tables. One Q table for value propagation and one Q table for doing the max. Double DQN is exactly the same ID, but in fact, since you already have the target network and the standard Q network, you can make profit of these two networks and just change a little the, cal the calculation. So this is a very minor change with respect to DQN. You just perform two, in two operations on the two different networks. And this converges twice faster than DQN in practice. This is, so this is very minor change with a very large impact. Another thing that you can do is the following. In fact, in DQN, you are taking the samples from the replay buffer randomly. Maybe you can do better than random selection of samples because, for instance, some samples may not provide any useful information. So um, Tom Scholl, uh, again, all these people are people from Google DeepMind, let, let me say uh, once and for all. Um, so Tom Scholl proposed rather to um, prioritize to prioritize the samples in the replay buffer according to their temporal difference error. So you put the highest temporal difference error samples in the beginning of your replay buffer, and then you put them in a decreasing order, and you will sample more often uh, the, 
the samples that have a higher temporal difference error. Because if you have a higher temporal difference error, this means that you have more to learn about those samples. So if you sample them more often, you will learn faster. And actually, doing this also converges twice faster. Okay. Uh, there are more hacks than that in the prioritized experience replay paper, so you can read it if you want to know more about those hacks. A third improvement that was proposed is called dueling networks. To explain this, I need to introduce the notion of advantage function, which is quite important when you are dealing with continuous state or action domains. So what's the advantage function? Is it, this is just the Q value of doing that particular action in that particular state minus the Q value of the best action. So you can see that, of course, this advantage function is in general negative and it is just null if you take the best action here. Okay. So this advantage function represents a regret for not performing the best action. Okay. If it's zero, there is no regret. And if it's a negative value, that's the value of taking this, which was worse than taking the, the, the best action. Okay. So the advantage function can also be represented as the Q function minus the value function, because the value function is the max over action of Q. Of, of Q. Okay. Uh, I won't go into the details why this is a good idea to use the advantage function, but uh, actually it was put forward by people interested in uh, divergence of reinforcement learning with function approximation, like, like Baird, and it has nice properties um, such as some uh, relationship with the natural gradient computation. But I won't go into those mathematical details because this, will, this would lead us too far away from this introductory uh, class. So dueling network are making use of the advantage function as, uh, as follows. Instead of using the advantage as this minus this, they mention that the Q function is the sum of the value function and the advantage function. So they design a, a, a specific neural network where the Q function is represented as the sum of two networks, one which uses the value function and one which uses the advantage function. And actually, in standard um, deep learning libraries like uh, TensorFlow or, or PyTorch, PyTorch, you can just represent any network with, you don't need to have neurons, you can have mathematical operators, if you provide the, the capability to derive with respect to this operator, then you can apply backpropagation to such a network. Okay. And the authors of drilling networks designed this particular network and tested it on a scenario with a driving car, and they showed that the value function and the advantage function are representing two different things that are of importance for uh, driving a car on a track efficiently. Uh, so it better captures some rele re relevant aspect of the control task, and this was proven to be efficient as, as a solution to reinforcement learning. And actually, we will see maybe later on on the final class that there is also a continuous action reinforcement learning algorithm, which is called NAF, that uses the same ID in the continuous action domain. So finally, if you take together all the, pre the improvements that I've presented to you. So if you take dueling networks, if you take prioritized experience replay, um, and if you take double uh, Q learning, the double DQN, sorry, and other uh, improvement that I won't present it to you right now, then if you combine all these, you get this algorithm, which is called Rainbow, which is about eight, eight times more performant than DQN itself. So when the DQN paper was published in Nature in the beginning, we were at human level performance for playing Atari games. And with Rainbow, which collects all these ideas, you are eight times more efficient than humans in learning uh, to play those games. And that's it about DQN and uh, the following algorithms. So again, if you have any question, don't hesitate to contact me. And now we will switch to the continuous action domain.